you guys could be here this morning. Uh, before we get started, we have just a few announcements. Uh, children and parents, after the service, Brother Danny would like to meet with you down here. Um, we would also like to congratulate uh, Michael and Lauren Childers. Uh, Luke Harrison Childers was born this week uh, on Thursday, I believe. And mama's doing good, baby's doing good, so praise God for that. Um, also, one quick note for Lottie Moon. Uh, we have decided not to have an auction this spring. Uh, instead, if you have items that you're going to donate to the auction and you don't want to store them at your house, say you have like a big item that you made that you don't really want to keep in your living room all year, uh, you can bring that in this week or any time, uh, and we will store it here. If there are any time-sensitive or perishable uh, items that you guys have made or had to donate, um, then bring those in, and we will figure out a way to use those, whether it is through uh, a silent auction or something through the Welcome Center that's going to you know, be a little bit more uh, into the future. Um, but we will figure out how to use those. They won't go to waste. So the Kentucky basketball tickets, if we were able to get those this year, I don't know. Uh, I believe there's some tickets to Dollywood or something. Uh, so those kinds of things that are going to expire, uh, bring those in, and we'll figure out a way to use those and raise money for Lottie Moon that way. And then next week, uh, during the worship service, we're going to have a special time where you can send someone from your family or your family can come up, and we're going to uh, give our donations uh, here in the worship service uh, like we have done in the past where the offering plates are up front, where we're not passing stuff around, but you're just going to bring up your offering for Lottie Moon, and there will be a special time next week. Um, so stand with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we uh, begin to worship him this morning. God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come together, uh, to be together as a family, to trust in you together as a family, uh, to have unity in Christ and in one spirit and one mind. Father, I just thank you for this sweet time that we have uh, every week that we put aside to gather together and to worship you together. Uh, and it's in Christ's name that we pray that we can glorify you in all that we do as we're singing and listening to your word being preached. Amen. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know that saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I put him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the My heart 
Thank you so much again for this time. I pray that as Brother Danny comes and gives the children's sermon, that you would open little eyes and ears and hearts to your gospel, to the, the truth that is in your word. And Father, may we look more and more like you each day and trust you with a growing childlike faith. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. All right. I knew giving away McDonald's would bring y'all. You weren't here. You didn't get it. But, um, no, I, I, I heard Brother Corey had a long sermon today. So I brought my pillow. And <laughs> no, 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 no. I did bring my, my, my uh, storm equipment. So in, uh, we came from Jackson, Tennessee, and Jackson is known as Tornado Alley. That means we get a lot of storms. And this, especially this time of year, you just kind of go, well, it's going to storm. When the temperature changes, we've, had, we've lost fences and trees and roofs. Uh, we were, I'm surprised, we went through four roofs um, in, I think it was 12 years. It was just kind of crazy. All these tornadoes came. Matter of fact, we had a, a big limb come through one of our windows, blow out the, 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 one of our windows. Um, so it um, becomes pretty normal. But uh, one, so one day I was, uh, one night I was in, asleep in bed, and, and um, Miss Stephanie, it, so the storm was coming, and I was, I was asleep. I, I sleep pretty hard. And she's, she's trying to wake me up, wake me up, wake me up. And then... What I didn't realize is one of the, when, when, the, um, when the limb came through the window, crashing through, the pressure in the house changed, and all the doors slammed shut, and I woke up. And I ran through the house, and I scooped up my boys, and we got in the middle of the hallway, and the doors were still shut. Everybody got in the hallway, and, and I got my little blanket and my pillow. I said, all right, let's lay down. And Mr. what are you doing? I said, that we're in the safest place in the house. There's nothing I can really do. And uh, so, so the boys, we kind of curled up and we prayed. I said, Let's pray. So we prayed and said, God, give us peace and protect us and, and be with us through this storm. And I went back to sleep and it made Miss Stephanie mad. <clears throat> One, that I could go back to sleep in the middle of a storm. But, I, you know, I, I thought, man, what, what better thing? It was in the middle of a storm. There's nothing else I could do. Now, the next day, I woke up, and I had a, I thought, what is wrong with my arm? And, and I had a little purple dot right there. You know what that was from? Miss Stephanie trying to wake me up. True story. She was like, Danny, 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 Danny. I was out. I was out. But, oh, oh, I have a purple dot. It was just the perfect size of her finger. But as I was reading a story in the Bible, I love this story in Mark chapter 4. It says, it says, uh, that day when the evening came, he said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side and leave the crowd behind. They took along with him uh, in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious storm came up and the waves broke over the boat. So it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you even care? We're about to drown. Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the winds died down and became calm. And he said to his disciples, Where? Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? See, I always wondered what would be the right what would have been the right answer. What should they have done? Should they have rowed more? Should they have tried more? I don't know. This is my thought. 
Wouldn't it have been cool if like, like one at a time the disciples was like, go check on Jesus, and it, he's asleep. And all of a sudden, one at a time, they came down and just kind of curled up like a bunch of kittens at his feet asleep. But that might be cool if all of a sudden Jesus, he's in the boat and the boat's living this, and he kind of looks down and there's his disciples all kind of curled up at his feet. I think it would have been pretty cool. If Jesus is, is, is asleep, then why? I mean, if he's not worried, why should I be worried? And sometimes the best thing we can do is take a nap. Sometimes what we can do is just kind of curl up in his lap and say, God, I've done what I can do. And I'm praying and I'm going to trust you. Then I'm going to curl up and lay at your feet. And there's been many nights, sometimes if you go to sleep and you're afraid, you know what I do? A true story. To this day, I'll hug my pillow. I'll say, Jesus, I love you. Can I curl up and take a nap with you? And it's like I get... I just feel like he says, Carla, I got this. There's nothing else you can do. Rest in me and trust in me. Now, the next morning, I got to get up and clean up limbs in the yard and, and look for people to help. And that's important, too. But sometimes in the middle of the storm, we need to go to God and say, God, I need to trust you. Help me trust you. And just curl up and take a nap. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, when I'm afraid... Help me trust you. Father, when I'm out of control and it seems like there's nothing can go right, Father, help me go back to this moment. Curl up at your feet and rest in your hands. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your power and your might and your comfort. We love you, Jesus, in your name. Everybody said, amen. Miss Sydney can take you upstairs if you want to go upstairs. For Children's Church? Yeah. Go ahead and stand with me again. Um, this morning, Brother Corey is starting a new sermon series. Um, and we're going to start it off by talking about Job and his story. Um, and like Danny was saying, we just sometimes just need to curl up and take a nap and trust God. And Job was put in a really hard position uh, by the circumstances of his life. And, you know, there's the whole book of Job where his friends, so-called friends, are, are talking to him. They're trying to figure out what he did wrong to deserve the circumstances that have come upon him. And Job's saying, I don't know what I did. I, don't, I feel like I've been obedient to God and righteous, and I don't feel like I deserve this. But he trusted God anyways. And after, after Job's friends are, you know, throwing these accusations at him and blaming him and even blaming, like, why are you not blaming God? And his wife says, if I were you, I would just turn your back on God and die. And this is God's response to all that conversation. In Job 38, God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its, its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the seas with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you shall come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? And this goes on for two chapters. And then in chapter 40, after God's finished talking to Job, the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. And then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And basically Job's saying, well, I am sorry. Who am I to question what you're doing with my life? Because God just laid out two chapters, probably seemed like an eternity to Job, of look at all the things I've done, and you can't even tell me how I did them. So who are you to not trust me? So this morning we're going to sing about the trust that we have in Christ as our anchor and our, our, our hope 
in everything, through any affliction, through any storm that comes our way. And it's all through the blood of Jesus. a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veil and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain lose all their guilty stains lose all
so much for the anchor of Christ, for sending your Holy Spirit to us that we might always be with you and that we would always be aware of your presence, or at least know that we have your presence with us, even if we don't feel it. God, I thank you for the truth that you have given us, that you are in control, that you are the creator of the universe and sustainer of life and the author of life and the giver of all good things. Father, we just thank you and we praise you this morning. As Brother Corey comes and preaches your word. May you open our hearts to your truth. May we be in awe of you, of who you are, of just your authority, and that we have been given the privilege to follow you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. So good to be here. And uh, we're starting a new series, uh, The Middle, Life in Transition. I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes you feel like you're in the middle of something. You're not sure what it is. The only middle that I like is the middle of an Oreo. Other than that, I don't like the middle much, do you? But uh, at any rate, our series uh, for the next five weeks is going to look at different people from the Bible and how they experienced transition, seasons of transition. They were in the middle of something, and they had to rely on God to get through it. I don't know about you, but I feel like that's where we are today. Um, heard this the other day. A college student was seen with a large K printed on his T-shirt. And somebody went by and said, uh, Hey, what's the K stand for? And he said, Confused. And the person asked the question, said, don't you know that confused does not start with a K? And he said, you don't know how confused I am. <laughs> and that's kind of where we are today. You don't know how confused I am. You know, as I was thinking about that, I was meditating on the book of Proverbs. And, uh, you know, when you walk by faith and not by sight, you're always seeking God for wisdom. Proverbs is a great book to go to in the Old Testament for wisdom. And I was thinking about the subject of God's guidance. Because let's be honest, as, as followers of Christ, we're always seeking God for guidance. God, what do you want me to do today? And what about this? And what about that? And as I was meditating on that, I have some Proverbs that I want to share with you quickly. And then we'll go to Job. Uh, but Proverbs 16.9 says, A person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. In other words, you may have plans, but God's purpose will transcend your plans sometimes. Uh, you know, I had plans to be a, a band director when I was a senior in high school. And then the Lord determined my steps by calling me to preach. Uh, and then Proverbs 19, 21, many plans are in a person's heart, but the Lord's decree will prevail. You know, we go through our lives and we always have plans, don't we? We're going to do this today, we're going to do that tomorrow, so on and so forth. 
but the Lord's will should prevail in our lives, regardless of what our plans are. My favorite is Proverbs 20, 24. In Proverbs 20, 24, even a courageous person's steps are determined by the Lord, so how can anyone understand his own way? Oh boy, have I quoted that many times and meditated on that many times in my life. What does that mean? It just means that when you walk by faith and not by sight, you're not going to understand what you're doing, even though you're following God. Does that make sense? Yay. All right. Some of you get it. Some of you are like, you just went over my head. I get it. Uh, we'll, we'll get that back. When you, when you are seeking God, then he determines your steps. And when he determines your steps, then he might lead you to do some things that you don't quite understand. I mean, go back and look at the testimony of Scripture. God told Noah to build an ark. It had never rained before. Forget about the flood. It had never rained before. You want me to what? Build a boat. What's it going to do? It's going to float. How? Just build the boat. I'll take care of it. Hey, Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. And then when he finally gets there, there's a famine in the land. Well, that's great, you know? I mean, we forget about those parts of the story that, that God led different people to do different things, and then as they started to do it, or when they did it, they said, I don't understand. This does not make sense. Uh, that's what's the middle of our story. When we're living by faith and not by sight, uh, it reminds me of my favorite proverb of all, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding and all your ways know him and he will make your path straight. So true, right? So true. And I share all that as prelude to, to Job. Uh, today, just today, we're going to look at the story of Job and I'm going to remind you of what he went through. You, you know this because I did a series, I guess, a year or so ago on this. But just as a recap, Job was a man who was faithful to God. And when you read the very beginning of his story, God is saying there's no one else on earth like him. Now, if God says that about a man, that is a high compliment. Job was faithful to God, and yet in a blink of an eye, he lost it all. He lost his possessions, he lost his family, he even lost his health. He developed these sores all over his body. And he began to question God. Who wouldn't, right? And his friends accused him, kind of like Devin was saying, what in the world, Job? You must have done something to deserve this because that's how their mind worked. You had to have done something for this to happen, so fess up, boy. What'd you do? Tell us all right now. Uh, that was Job, and that was his middle. He was in the middle of that situation. And then ultimately, if you fast forward to the end of Job, and that's where we're going to be today, chapter 42, the very last chapter of his story. Ultimately, he's restored by God. Okay, He lost it all. Now he's restored by God. He regains his health. Uh, God blesses him with uh, more family because now he lost several kids. Now he, he fathers more kids. So he, he, he has a family again and he has his health and he gets his influence and God doubles his possessions. Now he has twice as more livestock, cattle and all that stuff than he had before. And he lives a full and long life. The end. Wow. Wow. That's a great story. I mean, to see somebody go to th those kind of depths, and at the end, they go out on a high note, right? But here's the thing that always left me scratching my head. If you've read the book of Job, if you're familiar with the book of Job, you already know what, what, what I'm fixing to say. Here's the big question. He never learned why he went through that. He never learned. You know, if you read the book of Job, there in the first couple of chapters, it begins with a dialogue between God and, of all people, the devil. And uh, God says to the devil, hey, what are you doing? And he says, I'm roaming to and fro, you know, back and forth to the earth. And he goes, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. Oh, yeah, well, he's just obeying you, God, because you bless him. Let me take away the blessings and he'll curse you to his face. And God said, okay. And so in one day, he lost it all. And guess what? Job didn't curse God. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. He giveth and he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
And then you have the uh, conversation 2.0 between God and the devil. Hey, devil, what are you doing? I'm running to and fro throughout the earth. Well, have you considered my servant Job? Well, let me at least, and basically he says, let me, you know, let me inflict stuff on his skin because when a man suffers in his own flesh, he'll do something. And God says, all right, but you can't kill him. And then he loses his health. His wife tells him to curse God and die. And he says, hey, shall we not take the bad with the good in life? And he remains faithful to God. Now, you and I know that story because that's how Job starts in the Bible. But have you ever considered that Job didn't know anything about that? Job didn't know that God and the devil were talking. Job had no idea that any of that took place. All Job knows is one day everything's great, and the next day it's not. And then he begins to put his head down and just endure and grunt and groan his way through the middle of this situation. And finally he says, if I could just have my day with God in court... And as Devin read earlier, when God does show up, God shows up in the middle of a storm. Isn't that good? There's a storm on the horizon, and God shows up in the middle of the storm, and God begins to ask him, I, I counted it one time, Devin, it's been a long time, 90-something questions, could be more. But it was just question after question after question. It just makes your head swim. And finally, when Job gets a chance to come up for air, and God says, so, Job, what do you say? He says, God, you're out of my league. You're out of my league. I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. I, I take back what I said. I don't know nothing, God. I really don't know, even when I think I know. And that's kind of the gist of that conversation. But Job never learned why he went through the trials that he went through. That's why I think the biggest joke in heaven when we get there is going to be, look at Job, the guy with the light bulb going off, because he's going to go, so that's why this happened, huh, God? Okay, I get it now, because he, he won't know until then. But uh, he never learned why he went through the trials, but he remained faithful to God. And what I want to tell you is, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Because, see, here's the point. You and I find ourselves in the middle of a situation. And we're like, man, why is this happening? What should I do? I don't even know how to make sense of this anymore. What in the world, what do I do? Where do I go from here? What, what's next? And the bottom line is, be faithful to God, because that's all that matters. Look in Job, two, Job 42. Job 42, from the top. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything. And no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand. Things too wondrous for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words and I'm sorry for them. I am dust and ashes wow and that's job so here's my message for you today how to move forward when things don't make sense and that's my message how to move forward when things don't make sense the first thing is realize that god's in control realize that god is in control i love what job says there in verse two i know that you can do anything and no plan of yours can be thwarted. Now, before Job had this encounter with God, he might have believed that right here. But now that he's gone through the trial of his life, and he encounters a storm, and God shows up in the storm, and there's a lot of things he can't explain. There's a lot of questions that go unanswered. He doesn't find out why, but he does say this, I know that you can do anything. And I know that no plan of yours can be thwarted. And now that knowledge is not just here. It's right here in his heart. You and I have to realize that God is in control. Now I know all of us, I believe with all my heart, that every one of you here today would say from your mind, of course God's in control. Tell me something I don't know, Pastor. Well, I'm not trying to speak to your mind right now as much as I'm trying to speak to your heart. 
You and I need to know from the very depth of our being that God is in control. And that makes all the difference. One of my favorite psalms through the years has been Psalm 73. And verse 26 says this, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. And that is so true. You and I may think we're strong until we're not. And then we're like, wow, I didn't know it would be this hard. I didn't know it would be this tough. And you might get discouraged. You might want to quit. That's when faith comes in. And the psalmist says, my flesh, my heart may fail, but God is my strength. And because God is my strength and he's my portion forever, guess what? It's that anchor that holds through the storm and it shall not be removed. How do we move forward when things don't make sense? We realize God is in control and we resolve to serve others. We resolve to serve others. You know, I've often wondered why Job's story ended the way it did. Um, if I just stopped right now, you'd go, well, you know, God showed up. He was speechless and he waved the white flag and says, God, you're bigger than I am. You know more than I am. I don't know what I don't know, but you're God. The end. Curtain closes. But technically, this is not the end. We still have a few more verses here in the last chapter. Look, if you will, in verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job. Now look what happens next. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Lephaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now take, now remember this is Old Testament. Now take seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and, out, and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. And then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves. For you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. And then Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And then in verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. How interesting, right? You see, we, we really think of this being between just Job and God, God shows up, he waves the white flag and says, man, I am out of your league. And we kind of just, in our mind, we kind of mark the end, right? But it's not. Think about the human side of this situation. Job lost it all. And those that were closest to him, they meant well. I mean, they tried to encourage him. Matter of fact, I do want to give props to Job's three friends because if you read the very beginning of the book, when it all happens, they show up and they sit there in silence supporting him for seven days. Okay? See, you don't have to worry about what do I say when a loved one or a friend, you know, when something bad happens, what do I say? Sometimes it's just showing up. Okay? Just showing up, supporting and loving and just being there. And for one week... That's what they did. And it was great. Not that they did anything, but they were there. And they showed their support. They were there with Job. And then when the dust settled and the air cleared, <clears throat> Job, it just seems to us that you've sinned. Surely you've done something wrong to deserve this. And when they started prescribing... When they started becoming the counselor and prescribing to him what they were seeing and what they thought, that's when things went off the rails. And now that God has showed up and God has finished speaking to Job, he calls out one of the three, Eliphaz. And he says, you know what? I'm angry with you and the other two. And you haven't spoken the truth about me like Job has. So here's what I want you to do to show 
that you're sorry and to deal with this sin. Now remember, this is Old Testament. This is the sacrificial system and all of that. So they have a burnt offering, okay? And then he says, I want you to go to my servant Job and he will pray for you. Now this is where it gets good. Now before I explain this, let me give you a throwback story. So I can remember being, I guess, 13, somewhere in there, and I was at my grandparents' house one day. And a bunch of us had gotten together, kids in the neighborhood, and to make a long story short, a little friction, we all kind of took sides and we got into a little squat. You know, we had a little spat with each other. And my granddad heard about it and came out there and got right in the middle of it. And here's what he said. We're not doing that. That's not how we treat each other. You're all going to tell each other that you're sorry right now. And he put us in two lines. You over here and you over there. Now I want you to tell them you're sorry. Mm. And I want you to tell them you're sorry. Mm. And the worst part, Herman, when we got done saying the words, now go hug it out. Oh, no, no. I remember that. Didn't like a bit of it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't like a bit of it because in my heart and my flesh, I was still upset. I was still angry. Well, I want you to realize here, can you imagine? God shows up. He speaks to Job. He straightens that out. And then he turns and says, <clears throat> you, come here. I'm angry with you and you and you because y'all did not speak the truth about me. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take this burnt offering and you're going to go to my servant Job and he's going to pray for you. What? What I'm trying to get at here is they had to be humble. They had to humble themselves to do that. They had to come to the one that they had been pointing the finger at and say, would you pray for me? Now, if that feels awkward for you, let's flip it for a minute. What about Job? One day everything's great, the next day it's not, and then after a week your friends turn on you. And everybody's like, man, you've got some serious secret sin. I don't know, I don't know what you've done, but God knows, and look what he feels. Look how he feels about it, Job. Come on, man, fess up, right? And so Job now is told by God, you're going to pray for your friends. Now, it's one thing for people who are wrong to humble themselves. But what about when you feel like you've been done wrong? What about when you feel like you were the innocent party and not the guilty one, and yet God says, I want you to pray for them. But wait a minute, God, you don't understand. I'm still angry. Or that hurt. And God says to Job, you're going to pray for them. And this is so important because this is where the story really turns. There in verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. Yes, God restored Job in the end, but it wasn't until he prayed for his friends. God can't bless a mess. He can't. And so, wherever you are this morning, sometimes we find ourselves being the offender. And we have to look to God and say, you know, I am sorry. I was wrong. Maybe we need to go to another person and get it right. And it requires us to be humble to obey God's word. Sometimes we find ourselves in Job's shoes. We've been offended. And we don't like it. And yet God says, until you pray for them, I can't bless you like I want to. Ouch. That's exactly where it is. And that's exa exactly what happened. And so Job prayed for his friends. And not only did God answer his prayer, not only did God take care of his friends, God took care of Job and the Lord restored his fortunes. 
and doubled his previous possessions. You and I need to resolve to serve others. That's what that was about. You see, once Job realized that God was in control, that dealt with the faith issue. But now to deal with the obedience issue, he had to resolve to serve other people, even those that falsely accused him. Now that's hard. Nobody said this was easy. But that's exactly what he did. He resolved to serve others. You know, Jesus said, whoever wants to be first among you will be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So true. So how to move forward when things don't make sense? We've got to realize God's in control. We've got to resolve to serve others. And the third and final thing is to recognize God's blessings. To recognize God's blessings. You know, after Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and doubled his previous possessions. All his brothers, sisters, and former acquaintances came to him and dined with him in his house. They sympathized with him and comforted him concerning all the adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold earring. And so the Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first. And it goes on and talks about how he had you know, double possessions. He has seven more sons and three daughters. And then in verse 16, he lived 140 years after this. And saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. Isn't that awesome? He saw four generations of his family before he died. And then he died old and full of days. So those of you who feel old and full of days, you're not 140 yet or plus. So you're just not there yet. But uh, in all seriousness, think about this. Job recognized God's blessings. I think sometimes we just have to go back to the basics. Instead of looking at what's going on, let's look at what God's done. Let's look at what God has given us. Let's recognize His blessings and let's be thankful for that. I want to close with one more um, reference to Scripture. You know, I did a series this past year on Habakkuk. Uh, and it's kind of neat. This, is, this has been an unusual sermon for me this past week because I felt like God was speaking not only through His Word, but I felt like He was kind of tying this message to some things that I've already talked about and shared with you for the past year. It's kind of one of those moments where He kind of put things together for me. But when you look at the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk was a prophet in the Old Testament, and he questioned God's goodness. Because he saw so much injustice and evil and tragedy in the world. And he was concerned because God revealed that, uh, to him that he was going to send Babylon, an evil enemy nation, to judge Israel. And boy, did that get his attention. And throughout the book, we see that Babylon is an example of any nation that exalts itself above God and practices injustice, violence, and idolatry. And in the end, God reminds Habakkuk and every generation that God will deal with evil in his own time, in his own way. And we can continue to love and trust his timing and his plan as we remain faithful to him. And when you read Habakkuk, it's the very last part of the book that gets my attention. It's Habakkuk 3, 16 through 19. Listen to the words of the prophet. He says, I heard, and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. So if you stop right there, now his country is being invaded by this evil enemy. And he trembles. His lips quiver. Rottenness enters his bones. And he says, I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. And here's what he says. He declares this in faith. Though the fig tree does not bud, 
and there is no fruit on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there's no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. Sounds a lot like Job, doesn't it? Job lost it all. And he says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We have an anchor, rock, solid faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The world can turn upside down and inside out. You and I can lose it all. But if we have Christ, that is enough. And because we have Christ, even when things don't make sense, we know that God is in control. And we serve others. And we recognize God's blessings. And we wait for that day. When the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords comes and he will rule and reign forever and his kingdom will never, ever be destroyed. Now that's a great ending. Today I want to invite you. You might say, what do you want to invite me to, Corey? I want to invite you to a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to be confused anymore. I want you to know that he loves you. The Bible says that he proved his love by demonstrating one thing. While you and I were sinners, Christ died for us. I've always loved Romans 5.8. You see, you don't have to wait to clean up your life. You don't have to say, well, I'm going to get back in church and maybe God and I can get on good terms again. God demonstrates his love for you that while you were a sinner, you were separated from him, didn't know him, didn't really even care about him, and yet he cared for you. And he sent his son to come and to die on that cross for you and for me. Maybe today you need to take that first step of faith. When you realize how much God loves you, he died on the cross for your sin and for mine. He took our place. He died the death that you and I deserve. And he offers a free gift of eternal life to those who will come and trust and follow him. Maybe today you need to cry out to him. It's very simple. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the Pharisee and the publican. And Jesus says they both came to church. I'll contemporize this story. They both came to church and went to the altar. And the Pharisee looked at the other guy and said, Man, I'm glad I'm not like him. You know, I, I, I do this and I do that. And uh, he just, he prays like that. And the second guy is so humble, so broken, he won't even look up to the heavens. He looks down in humility and brokenness. He, he smites his chest and he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus tells the story and he says, Those two men went to church. Which one went home right with God? And you know the answer. It wasn't the guy who prayed to himself or about himself. It was the guy who was humble and broken and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. What a prayer. Just a few words. Lord, he's God. Have mercy, that's what I need. I'm a sinner, that's who I am. That was his prayer. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And if you've never asked the Lord to come into your life, when you realize he's God, you're not, that you're a sinner and you need his mercy to be saved, then you can cry out with humility and brokenness and cry out in faith, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he will answer that prayer. He'll come into your life. And it's my prayer today that you'll take that step of faith. I want to ask you all to stand. As Devin comes, he's going to lead us in a final song of worship. This is a time of worship that's also a time of invitation. And I want to encourage you today, those of you who are watching, if you are willing to take that next step in your walk with God, to text Step of Faith to 94000. 
And those of you here here today, I'm fixing to hop down here and worship with you. But I'll be here if you need to talk, if you need someone to pray with you. My, my, my hope is that you don't have to live a confused life. You can know the Prince of Peace and you can experience the peace of God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. I want to thank you for this time. I want to thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the testimony of your works in Scripture. Lord, I want to just thank you, Lord, that you are in control. And Lord, you have called us to serve others. And Lord, we do need to remember the blessings that we've received. But more than all that, Lord, we want to be faithful. Lord, you giveth, you taketh, but blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now. guys are going throughout your lives and work and school, it's my prayer that you guys would be filled with love for the people around you, that the love that God has for you and that has shown you would overflow and spill into the lives of people around you. So let's pray for them. God, thank you so much for the love that you have given and shown to us. God, I just pray that we would be filled with your spirit this week, that we would be aware of your presence with us that it would not just be something that we know in our minds that you are in control, but that we would feel it in our hearts and be truly at peace with peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I thank you for all the gifts that you have given us that we might be able to give back to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.